Good morning, fourth grade, and welcome back. Today we're going to be having a, a little bit of a shorter read aloud today. That's because the chapter after this one is pretty long and pretty juicy. So today we're going to have a shorter read aloud today, though, for chapter six of Holes. Today we're actually going to figure out why Mrs. DeYoung drew this symbolism on the board. We have a pair of shoes on the board. We're also going to figure out what crime that Stanley committed or didn't commit. You know, we know that Stanley says that he's innocent, and we'll see if he is or not. Maybe not today, but... We're going to figure out what it is that we think that he did, or the state thinks that he did. So, let's get started. Chapter 6. Stanley took a shower, if you could call it that, ate dinner, if you could call it that, and went to bed, if you could call it that. He had a smelly and scratchy cot of a bed. Because of the scarcity of water, each camper was only allowed a four-minute shower. It took Stanley nearly that long to get used to the cold water. There was no knob for hot water. He kept stepping into, then jumping back from the spray, until the water shot off automatically. He never managed to use his bar of soap, which was just as well, because he wouldn't have had time to rinse off the suds. Dinner was some kind of stewed meat and vegetables. The meat was brown and the vegetables had once been green. Everything tasted pretty much the same. He ate it all and used a slice of white bread to mop up the juice. Stanley had never been one to leave food on his plate, no matter how it tasted. What'd you do? asked one of the campers. At first, Stanley didn't know what he meant. They sent you here for a reason. Oh, he realized. I stole a pair of sneakers. The other boys thought that was funny. Stanley wasn't sure why. Maybe because their crimes were a lot worse than stealing shoes. From a store? Or were they on someone's feet? asked Squid. Uh, neither, Stanley answered. They belonged to Clyde Livingston. No one believed him. Sweet feet? said X-Ray. Yeah, right. No way, said Squid. Now, as Stanley lay on his cot, he thought it was kind of funny in a way. Nobody, nobody had believed him when he said he was innocent. Now, when they said that he stole them, nobody believed him either. Quiet Sweet Feet Livingston was a famous baseball player. He led the American League in stolen bases over the last three years. He was the only player in history to ever hit four triples in one game. Stanley had a poster of him hanging on the wall of his bedroom. He used to have the poster anyway. He didn't know where it was now. It had been taken by the police and was used as evidence of his guilt in the courtroom. Clyde Livingston also came to court. In spite of everything, when Stanley found out that Sweepy was going to be there, he was actually excited about the prospect of meeting his hero. Clyde Livingston testified that they were his sneakers and that he had donated them to help raise money for the homeless shelter. He said he couldn't imagine what kind of horrible person would steal from homeless children. That was the worst part for Stanley. His hero thought he was a no good, dirty, rotten thief. As Stanley tried to overturn on his to turn over on his cot, he was afraid it was going to collapse under all his weight. He barely fit in it. When he finally managed to roll over on his stomach, the smell was so bad that he had to turn over again and try sleeping on his back. The cot smelled like sour milk. Though it was night, the air was still warm. Armpit was snoring two cots away. Back at school, a bully named Derek Dune used to torment Aunt Stanley. The teachers never took Stanley's complaints seriously because Derek was so much smaller than Stanley. Some teachers even seemed to find it amusing that a little kid like Derek would pick on someone as big as Stanley. <coughs> Excuse me. On the day Stanley was arrested, Derek had taken Stanley's notebook and after a long game of come and get it, finally dropped it on the toilet in the boys' restroom. By the time Stanley retrieved it, he had missed his bus and had to walk home. It was while he was walking home, carrying his wet notebook with the prospect of having to copy the ruined pages, that the sneakers fell from the sky. I was walking home when the sneakers fell from the sky, he told the judge. One hit me on the head. It hurt, too. They hadn't exactly fallen from the sky. He just walked out from under a freeway overpass when the shoes hit him on the head. Stanley took it as some sort of sign. His father had been trying to figure out a way to recycle old sneakers, and suddenly a pair of sneakers fell on top of him, seeming out of nowhere, like a gift from God. Naturally, he had no way of knowing they belonged to Clyde Livingston. In fact, the shoes were anything but sweet. Whoever had worn them had a bad case of foot odor. Stanley couldn't help but think that there was something special about the shoes, that they would somehow provide the key to his father's invention. It was too much of a coincidence to be a mere accident. Stanley had felt like he was holding Destiny's shoes. He ran. Thinking back now, he wasn't sure why he ran. Maybe he was in a hurry to bring the shoes to his father, or maybe he was trying to run away from his miserable and humiliating day at school. 
patrol car pulled alongside him. A policeman asked him why he was running. Then he took the shoes and made a call on his radio. Shortly thereafter, Stanley was arrested. It turned out the sneakers had been stolen from a display at the homeless shelter. That evening, rich people were going to come to the shelter and pay $100 to eat at the food that the poor people ate every day for free. Clyde Livingston, who had once lived at the shelter when he was younger, was going to speak and sign autographs. His shoes would be auctioned, and it was expected that they would sell for over $5,000. All the money would go to help the homeless. Because of the baseball schedule, Stanley's trial was delayed several months. His parents couldn't afford a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer, his mother had said. Just tell the truth. Stanley told the truth, but perhaps it would have been better if he had lied a little. He could have said he found the shoes in the street. No one believed they fell from the sky. It wasn't destiny, he realized. It was his no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. The judge called Stanley's crime despicable. The shoes were valued over $5,000. It was money that would provide food and shelter for the homeless. And you stole that from them, just so you could have a souvenir. The judge said that there was an opening at Camp Green Lake, and he suggested that the discipline of the camp might improve Stanley's character. It was either that or jail. Stanley's parents asked if they could have some time to find out more about Camp Green Lake, but the judge advised him to make a quick decision. Vacancies don't last long at Camp Green Lake. So, we just found out what Stanley's crime was. So, Stanley was walking home from school after being bullied all day at school, and a pair of shoes fell from an overpass above him, a really fancy pair of shoes. So, Stanley decided to take them home to his dad so his dad could use them for his invention, and the cops caught him with them and thought that he stole this baseball, this famous baseball player's shoes. We hear a couple of words in this last um, few pages that I want to talk about. So, first word we hear is, we hear scarcity. Now, it's possible that you might know what the word scarcity is from a social studies unit in the past. So the word scarcity means a lack of. So scarcity is um, the way if we were at school right now and there wasn't enough toilet paper in the, to the boys' bathroom, there would be a scarcity of toilet paper in the bathroom. So scarcity is the lack of something. And they, they said that we had a scarcity of food at Camp Green Lake. We also hear the word... Let's see, what was the next word? We heard the word despicable. Now, despicable is a vivid verb. A vivid verb is a verb, well, no. It's a, <laughs> despicable is not a vivid verb. Despicable is a vivid adjective. It describes something and it's really, really powerful. That's why we call it vivid because it's very powerful. It's a vivid adjective. And what despicable does is it describes something bad. So instead of saying that the police officer is saying that Stanley's crime was bad, they said it's despicable. And despicable really has this bite to it. It's like it's despicable, disgusting, horrible, despicable. All of those things can kind of mean the same thing. So it's a very powerful, um, pungent word that really kind of bites at your tongue. And then the final word that we see here was souvenir. So the word souvenir kind of spelled weird. This is the word souvenir. And the word souvenir we see here in the sentence, and you stole that from them just so you could have a souvenir. You might hear the word souvenir when you're at a gift shop for like a museum or if you're on vacation and you're at some sightseeing place. Like if you go to Mount Rushmore, you'll see a gift shop and they'll say souvenirs here. Uh, a souvenir is basically just a little trinket or gift that kind of helps remind you of that place. So if you were to go to New York and you got a little tiny, tiny Statue of Liberty, little trinket, that would be a souvenir because it's a little tiny thing that you have now that reminds you of the place that you went to. Um, I personally, I have a bunch of magnets that say the places that I go to, little magnet souvenirs, like they'll say Mexico or they'll say Canada because I have a lot of family that lives in Canada. So I get lots of little souvenirs from Canada. So that's what the word souvenir means. So today we realized what these shoes were for. These are the shoes that Stanley stole. We realized the, what the word scarcity is, which means not much, lack of, despicable, which just means bad, but like a really, really good word for bad, and souvenir, which is just a little trinket that you get from somewhere that you go. So have a good day, fourth grade.